I think we're going to move on to Dr. Scow from uh, Avera eCare, and uh, and he will kind of go over some of the initiatives that they've uh, they've started actually uh, a long time ago, and 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 then kind of you know accelerating into current day. Um, Dr. Scow. Absolutely. Uh, thank you, David, for moderating, and then also for the VA uh, for putting this uh, workshop together. So I'm Dr. Brian Scow. I'm the uh, Chief Medical Officer of Avera eCare. Uh, in my role, I provide the physician oversight to our uh, 10 unique service lines. Next slide. So Avera Health uh, was founded back in 1897 by our Benedictine and Presentation Sisters, uh, who actually still, they sit on our board. They have a passion uh, for telehealth. And part of the reason for that is that we serve the underserved populations, especially in rural health care, Indian health services, and also prisons. Uh, Avera eCare uh, has been providing telehealth services uh, over the last 25 years. Uh, we're in over 500 sites, as you can see, uh, our footprint, and approximately 32 states. One of the things that we take great pride in is that we serve 15% of the critical access hospitals across our nation. Next slide. So to give you, uh, kind of to paint you a picture of uh, what does our operation look like? Uh, we're located in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Uh, we're located in the kind of the technology district. I like to call it the Silicon Valley of South Dakota, if there is such a thing. And uh, we have three different campuses. We have our uh, virtual hospital, uh, an administrative building, and a newly established telehealth educational center. Avera eCare started in 1993. In fact, our first patient uh, was a judge that was located in a remote uh, location. Uh, he had lung cancer, and we were able to perform a hematology oncology consult, evaluate him over the camera back in 1993, and avoid his transfer, provide him care. It would have been about a two and a half hour drive to seek that care. Shortly after that, we established our EICU service line. Uh, we provide critical care services in approximately 10 states to about uh, 200 plus uh, critical care beds, utilizing Philips VisiQ software uh, with uh, AI embedded into it to help to predict morbidity, mortality, decrease ventilator days, decrease ICU days, and also multiple different quality measures. Pharmacy shortly followed this. Uh, we have a pharmacy hub here in Sioux Falls, also in San Antonio, Texas. We have a team of pharmacists that provide care, uh, typically in critical access hospitals where they might not have the resources to staff pharmacists 24 seven. We're directly connected to their Pixis machine so we can assist with first medication order review, high risk medications such as thrombolytics, and in addition, provide uh, discharge planning. So when a patient's ready to go home, our pharmacist can have a video visit and go over all of their medications with them prior to discharge. Our emergency service line, I'm a little partial to. I'm an emergency medicine physician. This is probably our, rapid, our most rapidly growing uh, service line, which I'll get into on the next slide. Uh, senior care is where we provide care uh, in nursing, nursing homes and assisted living. We monitor around uh, 5,000 nursing home beds, and it's a geriatrician-led team uh, that's multidisciplinary, also with behavioral health and pharmacy. The goal here is to keep the senior care patients at their local skilled nursing facility. When we're involved in a call, we can avoid those transfers greater than 75% of the time, which is a big benefit uh, to these senior care facilities. Correctional health uh, began really out of the e-emergency program uh, where we're involved with prison care. And the goal here is keeping inmates inmates, avoiding those costly transfers and provide them a high level of quality care within the prisons. We identified that school nursing uh, was uh, in a shortage. So we started uh, a program approximately what was it, five years ago, again, mainly in the rural facilities to provide school nurses that couldn't staff it uh, during normal school hours. Uh, we have a few different quality protocols for head injuries on the, on the playground and also managing you know, high risk uh, children in school, such as children with insulin pumps. 
hospitalist was also defined out of a need from the e-emergency program. Uh, we have a team of internal medicine physicians that provide care for admitted patients uh, with the goal of providing, again, high level of quality care, but also supporting uh, the local rural facilities uh, that need assistance uh, with staffing. Again, uh, we have quite a few quality measures and it's a big benefit to these rural facilities. Specialty Clinic was born out of our Indian Health Services program where we can provide greater than 30 different uh, specialists to Indian Health Service clinics where the need is great. As we all know, behavioral health is one of the fastest growing uh, segments of telemedicine. Uh, within our behavioral health program, uh, we have a team of uh, physicians and APPs that can care for these behavioral health patients where they're located, uh, at home, in clinics, uh, hospitalized patients, and also patients that are in behavioral health units. One of our newer programs is a stress response where we can actually evaluate patients that get maybe get picked up there in the back of the actual police car. We have an iPad. We can assess them to determine do you need to be transferred to the emergency department? Are you medically cleared? And can we arrange this potentially as outpatient? Most recently with our COVID-19 response, uh, we've developed a disaster response. Uh, in addition, uh, we're involved with the NETSEN program, the National Emergency uh, Telehealth Critical Care Network, uh, and a few other areas that we're working on that we've defined uh, a virtual SANE program, sexual assert sexual assault nursing examination program, uh, in addition to e-respiratory therapy, which is a great need with COVID. But next slide. So this is a actual picture of our e-emergency hub. I'm sitting about uh, 15 feet away from it. I'm actually on shift now, but I did call somebody in uh, to cover for me. So what you are seeing here is uh, one of our 13 stations, and we have a di direct hardwired connection uh, to the critical access hospital. This is one of our 200 hospitals. So if you're sitting in that rural hospital, there's an easy button on the wall. With the, with the push of your finger, you get access to this care within about 30 seconds. As you can see, we're also connected to their PAC system to visualize x-rays, CTs, and directly connected to their EMR, uh, also with a link to the life pack. We can zoom into the life pack and around the room and, and see different things with our high definition cameras. So what are we doing in this program? We're providing peer-to-peer -peer support for uh, APPs, family practice physicians that are staffing uh, these rural critical access hospitals. Uh, we're using the most evidence-based uh, COVID protocols that we'll walk through uh, when we get these critical patients in. Uh, you can see Rachel, our nurse, uh, sitting there. And what she's doing is she can document for the bedside nurses to allow those nurses to do what they do best, uh, take care of patients. So we can do the full documentation. This also also allows them to remain in their PAPR and their PPE so they don't need to necessarily remove it. One of the things that we also take great pride in is our airway program. So we are connected to the video laryngoscopes that are at the rural sites. So when they have a glide scope and they're intubating, what they see on their five inch screen, we see in 50 inches of high definition. This allows us to assist with these difficult COVID intubations and they're not normal. What we're seeing on these intubations, we'll typically do anywhere from five to 10 a day, assist with them, is there is airway edema, airway swelling, massive secretions. And by definition, this is a difficult airway. So by having that second set of eyes and ears, it's definitely beneficial in these cases. Another area when they get uh, one of the sick COVID patients in and determine that it's beyond the capability of their facility, we'll assist with transfer. Uh, we can get a fixed wing, a rotor wing in to help transfer. And in addition, get them an accepting physician on the phone so they don't have to take their protective equipment off. They can remain in their PAPR. And then with COVID, we also defined a great need for respiratory therapy. Uh, we have a respiratory therapist that we can virtually beam into each facility. And what this does, it helps them manage the high flow nasal cannula oxygen, the BiPAP settings. And then most importantly, the ventilator settings, which we, as, we, we all know are a lot different than normal ventilator settings based on the most recent ARDS protocols. And what we're even finding, for example, some of our sites uh, that are in Texas that are surging uh, right now, they can't get patients out of there. Um, a lot of the regional facilities are on diversion. 
So having that extra level of support for ventilator management is really helping uh, to stabilize these patients. And when they have to keep them there local on a ventilator, which definitely is not their normal, we can assist with that. Next slide. So our, uh, our purpose here is uh, you know, access, quality, cost. You know, we've heard these things before, but truly it's access to these specialists on our different service lines. The quality of care. We have different quality programs that are tailored to each service line, reducing the cost, reducing cost through avoiding transfers, keeping patients local. And then most importantly, in having engaged and satisfied providers, uh, we're finding that through some of our research, we can improve recruitment and retention of providers. And also there's some, you know, antidotal evidence that it can help prevent burnout by having that extra level of support. Uh, next slide. A few of the, the challenges uh, that we're seeing on the consumer side, um, technology, um, the ease of use, the connectivity, uh, having appropriate LTE or broad broadband connectivity, uh, difficulty uh, with devices, we need to educate potentially better, uh, transportation needs, potentially getting to a clinic for a virtual visit. And I think the biggest opportunity is ease of access. We've done this kind of with our easy button and a few other protocols on our service lines. Also, a big opportunity through virtual visits, we can reduce unnecessary COVID exposure. Uh, we found uh, through one of our service lines that with the institution of virtual visits, our no-show rates are a lot lower, obviously, at home uh, than they were in the clinic. So that's another potential is that we get access to the patients more and improve timeliness of care. Next slide. On the provider side, again, uh, training challenges for device use, connectivity, troubleshooting, uh, potentially documentation limitations in the ER and limited resources. Big opportunity, we're getting better access to the patients. Um, the ease of visits at home. We can see essentially the social determinants of, of health at home. You can see, you know, what does their living room look like? Do they have allergies? Do they have a cat? Are they sweating? And, you know, you can see a lot of different things in the background uh, that gives you a, a lot more information. And then also the efficiency and effect effectiveness of use. Next slide. And on the quality and cost, again, issues have always been reimbursement. Um, you know, we do have the waivers currently. Uh, lack of access to clinic care to the biggest opportunity uh, that I see is uh, the genie's out of the bottle now, right? Um, the patients know what virtual care is like, and that's going to be their expectation moving forward. So uh, can we prove it? Can we research the impact of COVID had on telehealth utilization and potentially the cost savings? Uh, this access also means less cost, fewer emergency department visits uh, as far as the patients that are able to be seen at home, and then also improve patient compliance by also seeing them at home. Next slide. Our COVID response. Uh, so last March, uh, when COVID hit, when we were expecting a surge, it was essentially a wake-up call for us. And we had to ramp up our programs to try to provide the scope and scale of telehealth that was needed. Uh, the first thing that we identified is, well, what's one of the first patient contacts uh, that we'll have? And this was a, a local solution. And that was Askiners. A majority of our calls will be routed to an Askiners hotline. So we essentially changed that into a COVID call center uh, staffed initially by emergency medicine physicians and our nurses. And uh, we essentially took it over. And the goal there was, was let's identify and uh, let's identify the highest risk patients. And through that, uh, through our questionnaire, we could route them initially immediately into a virtual visit if they had the capacity. Uh, so we'd screen the calls for COVID symptoms and set up a virtual visit uh, if they had a cell phone, a laptop, or a computer. If they didn't, we did have preloaded iPads. Essentially, we could loan them with pulse oximeters to monitor them closely. Uh, we created multiple drive-through testing centers. In fact, we had a pork plant here in Sioux Falls uh, that had over 1,000 positives. It was the number one hotspot in the United States for a couple weeks. And we established a drive-through testing center and tested 3,000 patients in two and a half days. With our clinics closed, they essentially closed overnight. 
And uh, now we have a group of family practice physicians, all of our specialists, not able to see patients. So we trained hundreds of physicians and specialty care uh, docs uh, to see their patients at home. And it was kind of interesting. Normally, those clinics were packed, busy, so they might only do 10 virtual visits a day. That ramped up from 10 uh, to over 1,000, the 10,000% increase. These virtual visits also help to conserve uh, PPE and also reduce exposure if we can evaluate these patients at home. Uh, we deployed hundreds of iPads uh, to our uh, regional facilities and hospitals so they could place the iPads in patient rooms and do virtual hospitalist rounds. In our nursing homes, when they got locked down, we essentially created virtual nursing homes uh, with mobile carts. So our geriatricians uh, were able to do rounds on all the patients and in addition, created isolation wings in the long-term uh, facilities uh, to help prevent the spread of COVID. Uh, next slide. Some of our expertise, um, the utilization really requires educating the staff. So for example, on the e-emergency side, we're there for support. We're augmenting the quality care that they're providing. They're still a bedside provider. Uh, we try to get our customers very comfortable interacting on the camera with daily camera checks. Uh, in, in addition, when we have a real sick patient or a difficult call, uh, we'll do a debriefment and go over different lessons learned. Next slide. Uh, also, we're filling some of the coverage gaps by backing up APPs. We're empowering the providers and providing access to collaborate. Uh, next slide. And I mean, the future is wide open. We've done, uh, you know, the number of telephone visits as my other colleagues have just ramped up virtual visits uh, over video. Remote patient monitoring is key with the number of peripherals, triaging to the appropriate specialists. And then if you do have applications with uh, AI embedded, uh, that's also key to get the correct information. Next slide. So we want to build on this expertise, build relationships, build trust, and really keep vulnerable populations safe through the use of virtual care. If I have time, I think I've got a couple minutes left, I'd like to share a story. Uh, this was actually one of my patients, uh, Dolores is her name, uh, that really highlights the continuum of virtual care. So Dolores is a 65-year-old female. She actually resides in Florida, and uh, she was in her winter home traveling back to Sioux Falls. Uh, she arrived back in Sioux Falls, and unfortunately, it was during an ice storm. Uh, she was at the airport, slipped, and fell, fractured her right hip. Uh, she was transported to the hospital, underwent hip surgery, had an unremarkable recovery, and did need to go to a nursing home uh, for rehab. In the nursing home, she did quite well. She was actually ready for discharge. Um, this was right when COVID was hitting, and she actually came from a spot that was later defined as a hot spot. So she's in her nursing home, ready to be discharged uh, the next day. At 3 a.m., she spiked a fever of 103. Uh, she was in respiratory distress. Uh, they pushed the button. One of our geriatricians evaluated her over the camera, stabilized her to the capacity of the nursing home, put her on high-flow nasal cannula oxygen, got an, helped to get an IV going, gave orders, and her saturations were 70%. So quickly transferred her to a critical access hospital that was closest. Uh, that was also a critical access hospital. We had our e-emergency cameras in. She was on her second video visit. We were able to evaluate her over the camera. She was decompensating quickly, required immediate airway management. We were able to assist with the rapid sequence intubation. We were able to get her intubated, get her stabilized with pressors and fluid boluses, called for the flight team. Uh, we did get her vital signs somewhat stabilized, but she was still hypoxic. Uh, directly admitted her to our ICU, where we have our third set of camera interactions. The EICU physicians were taking care of her over the camera, adjusting the ventilator settings in coordination with the bedside staff. She was intubated for 10 days. Uh, she actually did recover. Uh, she was transferred to the hospitalist floor again where we have more virtual interactions seen on rounds virtually over a mobile cart when possible stabilized from that standpoint uh, from the hospitalist service she is transferred home with our remote patient monitoring team uh, giving her a loaned ipad and peripherals to include pulse oximetries seen daily by our family practice physicians and dolores is doing quite well today i'd like to say uh, so this, I mean, it's a great example 
uh, for me, just the true impact that telehealth can have across the entire continuum of from the patient when they get sick to when they go home. So thank you. Last slide.